For millennia, the quest for food and riches has motivated man to journey out to sea. Hainan is China's southernmost province. The warm tropical sun and the world's widest continental shelf have bred more than 1,500 types of fish and several hundred species of marine animals in its surrounding waters. In August each year, as the fishing season is about to begin, the Tonka people here are preparing to set sail. Tonka, or the boat people, have made the sea their home. They have lived on boats for about two millennia. Dozens of boats are tied together to form their villages. Children are born here, and the elderly die here. The location of Tonka villages is determined not just by land features, but by ocean currents, shoals of fish, and the wind. Until the 1940s, some Tonka villages would appear in a given location each spring and summer with the south winds and disappear in winter with the north winds. Centuries of drifting with the currents has made the Tonka outstanding seafarers and fishermen. Huang Yalu is preparing to dive to the deep ocean floor. Like his forefathers, the only tools he uses are a harpoon and goggles. He started diving when he was just 10 years old. Even without the aid of counterweights, he can dive to a depth of almost 20 meters. As he descends into the deep, the water pressure increases. After two minutes, it has squeezed almost all the air from his lungs. Ice-cold currents on the seabed work to irritate ear canals, bring acute pain and dizziness. This causes many divers to lose all sense of direction. Every second is crucial for Huang. Such struggles are to be expected whenever humans venture out into harsh environments. Since ancient times, in the search for food, resources, and wealth, people have overcome extremes to set up homes in the most unlikely places. The game of survival has changed both us and our natural surroundings. Man's continuous confrontation, compromise, conquest, and compliance with nature have brought different environmental outlooks in different ethnic groups. As the scythe sweeps across his scalp, Gun Liang Sheng begins his coming of age ceremony, officiated by the village elder. For the next few days, the elder will teach this eight year old child the basics of forced survival.
Despite being home to 139 billion trees, the average area of forest per capita in China is only one quarter of the global average. Today, such greenery is a rare and precious resource in China. The Basha Miao village lies in China's southwestern province of Guizhou. Surrounded by the forest here, Gunliang Sheng and his clansmen are among the few ethnic groups in China to have retained their traditional lifestyle. In the past, life in the forest was filled with danger. To prepare them for it, boys have undergone a coming-of-age ceremony when they are just seven years old. During the ceremony, the first gift they receive is a musket. Muskets are an essential survival tool for the Ba Sha people. Although Chinese law normally controls firearms strictly, Ba Sha men are still allowed to carry muskets to preserve their traditions and culture. Most of the guns they make themselves. Adults manufacture the metal components. The wood used for the grip traditionally must come from an orange tree felled by the boy himself near his own home. Orange tree wood is hard and does not splinter easily. A musket grip made from this wood will serve the child for his entire life. elder will give Gunliang Shun his first lesson in hunting. Now he must be fully alert to his surroundings to track his quarry. To shoot an animal, he will learn to rely on his hearing and smell. More importantly, he will learn to use his instincts to judge risk. Six kilometers from Ba Sha Miao village lies Songjiang County where Gun Liang Shun's father works. For an eight-year-old boy, the city offers more temptations and attractions than the simple Miao village. As the city expands closer to the village, Knowledge and skills accumulated over several centuries of forest life are of less and less practical use. Gun Liang Sheng's father now travels there for work. So why should the boy himself follow the village elder to learn the ways of surviving in nature? Yarkant County, Xinjiang, a muddy torrent thunders down river. Annual floodwaters now inundate the bed of the Tarim River. The Tarim River is China's longest inland waterway. Its source lies among the snowtop peaks and glaciers of the Pamir Mountains. After flowing more than 2,000 kilometers, it peters out into China's largest desert, the Taklamakan. To locals, the Tarim is known as a runaway horse. Every summer, as the temperature rises, the melting of snow and ice in the mountains causes a rush of water, violently cutting through the soft soil of the land. When the water rises high enough to burst the river's banks, the surrounding area turns into a lake. 
Ka'ar Jaku village lies on the banks of the river. To defend themselves against floods, the villagers use tree boats to construct simple embankments. First, three trunks, three meters in length each, are lashed together with wire to form a cone. The inside of the frame is then stuffed with leaf-covered branches. Finally, the frames are lowered into the water. By becoming waterlogged, the frame and branches add weight and external force to the structures, firmly fixing them in the mud of the riverbed. Their design is primitive, but they can greatly reduce the force of the current and weaken the erosion of the river's banks. Every summer sees the same battle between man and nature. Despite the villagers' efforts, the floods will eventually carry away most of the flood barriers, and with them, the villagers' hard work. Why then do they not construct more substantial embankments, bringing nature under their control once and for all? For Beyond Joe, bringing nature under man's control is not just a job, it's his life's mission. Beyond Joe's home is in Loka, Tibet, where the warm and moist air currents of the Indian Ocean are blocked from reaching by the Himalayas. Loka lies in the valley of the Yarlung Songpo River, but has little precipitation. For seven months from December each year, the winds in the valley reach speeds of up to 17 meters per second. Even yaks are unable to withstand such a force. Once the dust settles, the land turns into a desert. <laughs> The best way to prevent sand encroachment is to plant trees. To prepare the soil for this, square meter straw checkerboards reduce wind erosion. Sowing grass seed within the squares then fixes the soil. Once the soil layer is stabilized, cuttings can be planted in the soil. In about three years, there will be hundreds of thousands of saplings. Beyond Joe is proud of his plan. With time and patience, he hopes forest will reconquer the desert. The Taklamakan is China's largest desert. Dunes stretch as far as the eye can see, and in places the land is as desolate as the moon's surface. Karchuga village lies in this bleak region. 
Unlike most people who live in desert, the main source of livelihood for the Lop Nur people is not herding, but fishing. The Lop Nur people hollow out poplar trees into dugout canoes. Using these traditional vehicles, they can hunt fish. In addition to protein, the fish are a good source of salt, which is scarce in the desert, as well as other essential micronutrients. Water is of course scarce in a desert, so why is there a relative abundance of it here? Lopner was once a salt lake. When the Tarim and Shula rivers flood each year, water once again crosses its dunes to cover hundreds of kilometers of desert in a floodplain. Flooding like this was once seen as a disaster. Now it is recognized as a means of survival for the poplar trees here. The Euphrates poplar is the most tenacious living thing in the desert. Mature trees can grow root systems as deep as they are high in their search for water. Poplar saplings rely completely on the annual floods for survival. After the floods pass, water permeates the porous soil to nourish the saplings. Over tens of thousands of years, this water has formed into river channels, stretching for thousands of kilometers below the desert surface. The repeated inundation of floodplains carries poplar seeds and saplings into the depths of the desert. With the passage of time, the world's largest Euphrates poplar forest, covering 38,000 hectares, has formed in the Taklamakan, the desert that is dubbed the Sea of Death. The poplar forest's ability to hold water enables locals to fish and hunt in the depths of the desert, forming the core of Lop Nur culture. When a local dies, their body will be laid out in the canoe that has served them throughout their life. They believe they can only complete the cycle of life when they return to the great waters and poplar forests in which their forefathers lived. Nature's splendor and scale are on full display in this great land. Nature traverses time and space to form a circle of life. Within this circle, it manifests its own rules in the most unexpected ways. Legend has it that Saru, near the town of Sutong, was the first land to be cultivated in Tibet. Only a river separates it from Bianzhou's sapling nurseries. Bianzhou does all he can to overcome the wind and dust. But in Saru, the wind was historically a benefactor.
When it abated, it deposited earth, minerals, and the remains of wind-blown plants to form a soil layer on which humans scattered seeds and gathered a harvest. This formed the basis for the earliest civilization on the plateau. in terms of their place in the cycle of nature. Chen Shuxin is 12 years old. From a young age, the unique environment of her upbringing has caused her to think about such questions. Chen Shuxin was born in Shenzhen, where just 40 years ago, there was only a sleepy fishing village. Today, there is a metropolis of over 10 million people. Chen Shuxin's parents came to Shenzhen after they graduated from college. Beneficiaries of the city's extraordinary growth, they enjoyed success and prosperity and are now able to provide a good education and quality of life for their child. Although they did well in providing a solid foundation for their child's future, however, they found that she was still not happy. The black-faced spoonbill winters on the south coast of China and is the emblem of Shenzhen. Among the six species of spoonbill in the world today, it is the only one listed as an endangered species. Chen Shu Sin first encountered this bird at the age of six. She saw a spoonbill mother in the city instead of its natural environment trying in vain to find a home for its chick, and it moved her to tears. Since then, finding a home for spoonbill chicks has been her biggest wish. Chen Shu Sin finds it hard to answer such questions. She has a home in the city with her parents, with spacious rooms and a piano. While Chen's home has been getting bigger, the spoonbills has been shrinking. In the past few years, 69 square kilometers of land has been reclaimed from the sea near her neighborhood. Mm -hmm. 
Chen Shu-sen begged her father to set up a non-profit organization to clean garbage from the ocean. She knows doing this is far from enough, but at least it might give Spoonbills a clean place to grow up. People move to cities for a better life. The attractive jobs and comfortable housing they seek need space, which has, for the most part, been taken from the natural world. Ultimately, the expansion of cities comes at the expense of the environment. Trees, water, and even clean air become increasingly scarce and people start to produce expensive equipment to save nature. Urbanization has been a necessary accompaniment to industrialization, but city living has put humans in a vicious cycle. How can we break it? The Wudong mountain range in Hubei is home to China's most famous Taoist temple complex. With mist covering its peaks, forests, and lakes, the landscape is as perfect as a classical painting. Pilgrims have been coming here to meditate since the Han Dynasty more than 2,000 years ago. By controlling your thoughts and breathing, it is believed you can elevate your body and soul to a higher state of being. Kung Fu is an essential part of Taoist practice. Practitioners may imitate animals, plants, or even clouds and water to come up with new fighting moves. Devotees believe that repeated practice will not only enhance their physical condition in the shortest possible time, but also help them understand the mysteries of nature. I'm also a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Alberta in Canada. Uh, my supervisor, Jean Debenardi, did research in uh, Udang Mountain for seven years and I highly recommended I come here to study my talk. I've come from very far to learn uh, Udang Wushu. I've been training for one month and I would like your permission to join the advanced sparring class. I think you just training one month. I think it's hard for you to join this class. 
I've trained very hard for this month. I'll do whatever it takes to join the class. You should know that when they're training, you know, they are fighting, they have good coordination. Otherwise, you get hurt, you know, you get hurt. Maybe it happens. My body's strong, I can take it. If, if you want to try, I, I will, I will tap. metal can cut down trees, but the trees can be used as fuel for fire, which can also melt metal. With this simple theory derived from observation, the Chinese people have seen nature as a complete system with continuous cycles for as long as 2,000 years. Unlike the West, whether in life or in Kung Fu, the purpose is not to win a competition of natural selection. The aim is to make yourself an equal member of this system through continuous cycles. In Chinese culture, this pursuit is called being at one with the universe. sunshine, water, and fertile soil make it the first place in China where canola flowers blossom. Dotted with conical peaks, more than 50,000 hectares of canola are spread out in a vast expanse of flowers. Chin Chongliang earns his living with these flowers. He is a beekeeper. The area around Luoping is the Yunnan Guizhou Plateau. Over hundreds of millions of years, tectonic movements have lifted thick strata of limestone or calcium carbonate up from what was once a seabed to high elevations here. Water erosion then worked to carve the rock into gorgeous formations. If the landscape is like a canvas created by geological forces, then the painting on that canvas can be said to have been laid down by bees just as much as people. Bees are essential for the pollination of canola, as well as many other crops. 
Some experts believe that if bees were to disappear, mankind could only continue on for a few more years. Every year in Luoping, when the canola flowers are in full bloom, honeybees from nearly 40,000 colonies are busy with this work. They are the reason why the rapeseed yield in Luoping is 40% higher than in other areas. Beekeepers like Chen need good bees, and to make them produce honey, the first thing they need to do is domesticate them. In Luoping, there are two types of bees, native Chinese bees and imported Italian bees. Chen's goal is to find Chinese bees. Chinese bees become active at 6 in the morning and, in total, work for four more hours a day than Italian bees. They have been pollinating local crops for thousands of years. That means they are better at finding plants that Italian bees often overlook. The biggest advantage of using local bees is their obedience. Once the queen has been captured, the whole group will follow her to the hive. Bees set up colonies far apart in the wild to avoid predators and each other. Their honeycombs are often hidden in cliffs. Catching a queen bee requires not only physical agility, but also courage. Smoke calms restless bees and makes them less aggressive. Central to the task is to make the queen appear. finally bags his hard-earned prize. Within the context of millions of years of evolution, his efforts may seem negligible. It is because humans continue to do this kind of work that they have managed to minimize conflict between man and nature. Harmony is not about defying nature or seeing humans as superior to other creatures. It's about finding a place for everything in the cycle of nature. For thousands of years, Chinese people like Qin Chongliong have been living in the embrace of nature. Through hard work, Chinese people live harmonious and sustainable lives and achieve a balance between man and nature.
Back in the Ba Sha Miao village, Gun Liang Sheng is starting the most difficult part of his coming of age ritual. He has to learn to mimic the sounds of nature with an instrument made of bamboo. Basha Min must master this essential skill, not only to propose to their fiancés, but also to communicate with their ancestors. When a Basha person is born, a tree is chosen to represent them in the forest. When they die, they are buried under the tree. There are no graves in Basha villages. For children, every tree in the forest is a relative. They often refer to the trees as their grandparents and elders. Ancient practices may not have much practical use today, but wisdom accumulated over time can still guide us in our lives. And perhaps, by the time we cross the boundary between human and nature and connect to each other, there will be more harmony in our lives. <laughs>